At the happy era of the Reformation, many of the grosser corruptions which had grown during the long continued defection which had preceded were removed in several countries, and in some of these, particularly in, particularly in Scotland, religion was settled on a scriptural basis and in great purity. Had Reformation been at its height in all the Protestant churches, or had that which had, was attained in some of them been placed beyond the danger of being changed or relinquished, there would have been no need for testimonies or contending in the way of separation from them. Few will pretend that this is the case. In the constitutions of some of these churches, the features of the man of sin are but too visible. And those of them that were most renowned for beauty hath given evidence of their defectability by actually falling into decay. To rectify the one and recover the other is a work which deserves the attention and utmost endeavors of all who wish well to the interests of religion. And to accomplish these ends in some degree within their sphere was what those who declared a secession from the established Church of Scotland, proposed by the association which they formed, and avowed in the testimony or declaration of their views and intentions, which they published to the world. As their object has been much misunderstood, and as mistaken or narrow and partial notions of it have been adopted, not only by their opponents, but also by not a few of their professed friends, it may perhaps be of some use to take a cursory view of it. Some have represented seceders as holding a set of religious principles altogether peculiar to themselves, and have attempted, ignorantly or artfully, to set these in opposition to the principles held in common by other Christians and Protestants. Such a representation is groundless and injurious. Their profession, while it rests on the ground common to all true Protestants, the supreme authority of Scripture, embraces the general interests of Christianity and gives them their due place and importance. Whatever others, as Christians, Protestants, or Presbyterians, profess and glory in, they vindicate as theirs too, and have embodied in their testimony. With respect to those things by which they are distinguished, in principle or in practice, from other denominations of Presbyterians, and which will be called their peculiarities, they plead that these are either expressly warranted by the word of God and the subordinate formularies of the Church of Scotland, or follow from them as conclusions from premises and corollaries from geometrical axioms. And they plead further that these are, in different respects, necessary to the support and the consistent maintenance of the other. On the contrary, some late partial historians of the secession have done injury to its cause in another way, in order to present it in a point of view more attractive to the spirit of the present age or more congenial to their own sentiments, they have narrowed its ground, thrown some of its prominent parts into shade, and fixed the attention wholly on others which, however important in the eyes of the founders of the secession, never occupied their entire and exclusive regards. The exertions which they made in defense of the leading doctrines of the gospel and the rights of the Christian people are too well known to stand in need of empty panegyric, and those do little honor to their memory who deal in this, while they disparage or throw a veil over their contendings in behalf of a great and extensive cause of which these formed but a part. When it appeared that there was no reasonable prospect of the grounds of their separation being removed, and of their being able to return conscientiously into the bosom of the established church, the seceding ministers found it their duty to dispense divine ordinances to those through the country who labored under the, under the same grievances with themselves. But they did not act on the limited principle, afterwards adopted by another society, of merely affording relief to those who felt galled and oppressed by the yoke of patronage. Nor did they think that they could discharge the duty which, as ministers of Christ and of the Church of Scotland, they owed to the existing and subsequent generations. If they confined their endeavors to the promoting of what immediately concerned the spiritual interests of those who might place themselves under their ministerial and judicative inspection, they felt that there was a public cause and more general and extensive interests which had a claim upon them. They, along with the people adhering to them, had for a series of years been testifying, in communion with the established church, against a variety of evils deeply affecting the interest of religion, or, as they express it in their deed of secession, a course of defection from our reformed and covenanted principles. Finding themselves now placed in a new situation, and in the possession of greater liberty than they had formerly enjoyed, looking around them on the religious state of the church and nation with which, 
they were connected, and taking into serious consideration the manifold obligations under which they lay, they judged themselves called, in the course of sovereign and holy providence, to essay the revival of Reformation, and to employ all the means competent to them for advancing this work. In prosecution of this design, they published their judicial testimony and other official papers, settled the terms of their communion, and regulated their public managements. The object proposed by the founders of this association was of a precise and definite kind. As they did not push themselves forward, nor put their hand to a work of such difficulty without being satisfied of the call which they had to engage in it, nor proposed to do more for its advancement than providence might put in their power, and lay within their sphere as an ecclesiastical body, so they did not conceal the objects which they aimed at, nor leave the world in any doubt as to their nature and extent. It was a specific reformation which they proposed. They did not come forward in the suspicious character of general reformers who would not avow that they intended to pull down and did not know what they would build up in its room. They did not plan to reform according to a scheme of principles of their own, nor was it their object to overturn that church which had lately driven them from its communion. But they appeared as a part of the church of Scotland, adhering to her reformed constitution, testifying against the injuries which it had received, seeking the redress of these, and pleading for the revival of a reformation, attained, according to the word of God, in a former period, approved by every authority in the land, and ratified by solemn vows to the Most High. Without right views of this reformation, it is impossible to understand the secession testimony. The disaffection to the former, in proportion to the degree in which it prevails, necessarily implies a dereliction of the latter. The same principles which led our fathers in Scotland to free themselves from the tyranny and corruptions of Rome induced their successors to cast off the imposed yoke of a Protestant hierarchy and to rid themselves of the abuses which it had brought along with it. When they associated for this purpose, they needed only to renew the covenant by which popery had been first abjured with a few slight explications and accommodations of its language to their existing circumstances. It is not, therefore, needful for me to go back farther than the Second Reformation, as it is usually called, which took place between the year 1638 and 1650, and which embodied in its proceedings and settlement all the valuable attainments of the First Reformation and carried them to a greater extent. These included, summarily, the revival of the purity of doctrine which had been corrupted by popish errors introduced under the new garb of Arminianism, of the purity of worship which had been depraved by the imposition of foreign rites and ceremonies, and of the government, discipline, and liberties of the church, which had been supplanted and overthrown by royal supremacy and the usurpations of prelacy. But the most important and discriminating feature of this period was the extension of the Reformation to England and Ireland. It is well known that religion was very imperfectly reformed in the first as well as the last of these countries, and that many popish abuses and corruptions were allowed to remain in its worship and government. These defects had been all along complained of by the best English Protestants, who often sighed for the purity and freedom of religion enjoyed by their neighbors. The growing oppression of the ecclesiastical courts, the religious innovations tending to pave the way for peace with Rome, and the invasions on the civil liberties of the nation during the early administration of Charles I. Inflamed by these complaints and wishes, and communicated to them the greater and better part of that kingdom, the struggle which ensued between the friends of Reformation and Liberty on the one hand, and an arbitrary and popishly affected court on the other, led to the formation of the famous Solemn League, which had for its principal and leading object the preservation of the Reformed religion in Scotland, the Reformation of religion in England and Ireland, and the bringing of the churches in the three kingdoms to the nearest conjunction in uniformity and doctrine, worship, discipline, and government. From this time, the Reformation in Scotland, England, and Ireland was combined, and whatever may since have actually been its actual fate in any of these countries, its true and enlightened friends have never ceased to regard it as one common object of interest, and, so far as it was in their power to promote it, of endeavor and exertion. The steps taken to fulfill these sacred stipulations, the progress made in the word, and the causes of its being interrupted in England, endangered in Scotland, and at last perfidiously overthrown in the three kingdoms, are known to all who are not utter strangers to the most 
interesting and eventful period of the history of Britain.